Welcome to Top of Mind, the show where we talk to real estate industry insiders and experts about the biggest trends impacting the market today. Enjoy the show. Mike Simonson here. Thanks for joining me today. Welcome to the Top of Mind podcast. This is where I talk to the smartest leaders, thinkers, and doers in the real estate industry. For a few years now, we've been sharing the latest market data every week in our weekly video series at Altos Research. With the Top of Mind podcast, we're looking to add some context to the discussion about what's happening in the market uh, from the leaders of people who have a real perspective on what's going on. Each week, of course, Altos Research tracks every home for sale in the country. We analyze all the pricing, all the supply and demand, all those changes in that data, and we make it available to you before you see it in the traditional channels. So people desperately need to know what's going on right now. Uh, the market is so crazy. Suddenly the landscape is changing. Everybody is worried about what happens in 2023. So if you need to communicate about the market to your clients, go to altosresearch.com. Just book a free consult with our team. We can talk about the local data for your team and for your area. And we can talk about how you communicate the market data to people who need to know it, buyers and sellers in the real estate market around the country right now. So speaking of real estate data and informing your clients, I've got a terrific guest today. Mark Fleming is the chief economist for First American Financial Corporation. In, in this role, he leads an economics team responsible for analysis, commentary, forecasting trends in the real estate and mortgage markets. Mark is primarily focused on real estate and urban economics, applied econometrics, uh, and mortgage risk. And he's an influential voice in the housing industry. If you read the Wall Street Journal or the New York Times or Housing Wire, uh, if you watch broadcast business news, you have probably seen Mark or heard from him. Uh, Mark and I have actually known each other for a bunch of years. We've shared the stage at conferences. And so he's really one of the top experts on, on what's happening in the housing economy right now. And so I'm thrilled to get to talk to him today, get his take on 2023. So Mark, welcome. Hey, Mike, how are you? You know, I got to say, it has been a number of years. This is why the hairlines are receding. We've been doing this for too long, I suspect, together. <laughs> That's right. Uh, we have there's some we have some good stories about like making making predictions on stage uh, together. That's those right. Kind of things about <laughs> the market. Uh, maybe we'll get to those today. Uh, first, though, I I want to hear. I like to hear just a little bit about uh, you know your background and tell us about you know what's first American focused on. And and your and your role there right now. Yeah, so actually, I wasn't planning on participating or being a professional in the real estate industry at all when I went to graduate school and got my PhD. I was sort of studying econometrics, you mentioned, which is basically the application of statistics to the discipline of econ. But when I was there, I sort of got stuck into building models to predict house prices and understand land use change, and that led me to. Uh, Fannie Mae, where I learned mortgage risk, and then where you and I have known each other through our careers, I've worked in some way, shape, or form in some sort of in a data and analytics sort of company related to the mortgage industry. And uh, it's been a wild ride. I, I love it in part because um, I like to say real estate and housing, you, you can't offshore it and everybody needs it. And so while this might be the second go round of sort of dire times in the industry, because we've been around long enough to remember the global financial crisis, at the end of the day, it still matters. Everybody needs shelter, and we can't do it anywhere else than here. And so that's a solid underpinning for a professional career, right? That's that's a great way to look at it. Uh, even if we get a big cycle, we're still like the houses are going to be here. Uh, yeah, and 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 so our and our being analyzing from being on the ground here helps. Right. Yeah. Oh, you're in the thick of it in San Francisco. I mean, that's like ground zero right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. All kinds of stuff happening. Okay, so, yeah. um, so then you uh, you started at Fannie Mae. Yeah, I spent four years there. That's really where I learned mortgage risk, honestly. Yep. Um, and then uh, I know you were at CoreLogic for a while, and you've been at, at First American for a, uh, a while. Yeah, and this you... is. I just passed my eight year anniversary at First American. So, eight years, man, I like to stick around in good jobs, you know. 
Yeah. <laughs> What's so so first American Financial? Uh, I know I'm in title insurance, but what else are we? What else is the the company do? Well, yeah. So that's our our bread and butter. Is we're one of the largest title insurers and settlement service providers in the in the country. Um, but we also have a large data and analytics division. We collect public records data, much like um, other providers out there that, that I'm sure you you know. Um, and we use that data not only for our own purposes, obviously the core of making a title underwriting examination is public records data, but um, sell it in bulk and build products on top of it. Um, AVM, something I've been around for decades, are all sort of in our wheelhouse, essentially data and analytics for the real estate industry is also part of what we do. Yeah, for sure. Uh, the, the, um, uh, the, the insurance companies the, were the origination of the, the real estate data world, right? Like got on, we got, right. we are the ones who have to know what's going on out there. Um, terrific. Okay. So, um, so let's start with, um, Let's start with a question on everybody's mind, which is like, what the hell is going to happen in 2023? What's your view of the next year? It's now mid-December when we're recording this. All right. No more dancing around the easy questions. Just go straight to the heart of it. Just go straight in. Yep. Uh, uh, Well, I I think to, to look at and understand 2023, we have to do two things. One is consider, um, what's happened over the last few years, particularly sort of taking that historical perspective through the end of 2022. And then of course, whatever happens in 2023 is absolutely foundationally based on what happens to inflation in 2023. So part one, uh, we're sort of returning to a world of more normal when it comes to the housing finance and and real estate industry, right? House price appreciation is slowing down. We can talk about why later, but um, it was not normal during the pandemic to have house price appreciation rates of 10, 15, 20 or more percent per year. That's not normal. Good reasons why, but not normal. Um, Mortgage rates at 3%. Again, that was the anomaly and not the norm. And now the big shock that happened in 2022 was we went from a rate handle of somewhere around three to six and a half or seven, or maybe back closer to six, depending upon, you know, exactly where we're actually as of today, you know, a little bit closer to six again. Um, But, you know, that's a doubling of mortgage rates. And the combination of increasing mortgage rates by double and the amount of house price appreciation that has occurred is basically reducing house buying power for consumers um, by very significant amounts. The median priced, uh, cost has gone up by over 60% uh, relative to just a year ago during the pandemic. Well, I'll ask the silly question, and it doesn't take a fancy economist to answer it. If the price of the good goes up by 60%, what happens? Demand has pretty much evaporated. Right? Yeah. And you, and when you say the cost of the good, you're really talking about the payment that people have to make. Is that? Yeah, that's is- a great distinction because Honestly, no one really cares. Well, I guess if you're buying a home with cash, but that's not most people. Uh, you don't really care about the nominal price. It's the how much per month. And so that's the cost to me to own a home is the how much per month. And that's what's gone up by such a dramatic amount. Essentially, we call that reduction in house buying power, if you will. Yeah. And, I, and I'm interested in uh, a, a lot more on diving into that topic in particular. One of the things I observe in the in the last 24 months you know we had the the pandemic um phenomenon we had uh, these bidding wars and we had immediate sales so a house gets listed and goes into contract immediately with offers and those bidding wars seemed nuts at the time i'm going to overbid by $100,000 or uh or $150,000 but in retrospect you know when rates are 2.8%, another 100,000 bucks doesn't move my payment very much. That's right. That's right. And now rates at 6% or 7, every dollar matters. And so all of that bidding premium evaporates. It's like the first thing that goes away. If you, 
I mean, I always like to go back and say, remember 1981, mortgage rates were 18%, right? 18.1, they peaked at 18.1. It's actually probably a pretty similar comparison to today. Obviously not the level, but in the rates of change and inflation, so sort of, sort of the qualitative fundamentals are very similar. First of all, people still bought homes. But if you think about this, and let's make it, to make the math easy, let's round it up to 20. With a, with a mortgage rate like that, you're basically paying $20 for every $100 you borrow every year, yeah. right? 20%. So the pr for the privilege of borrowing a hundred bucks from the bank for one year, I got to pay you back 20. I still got to pay you back the hundred, yeah. but I got to pay you back 20. To your point, that is vastly different than $3. Right. So the, the opportunity cost of borrowing that marginal extra chunk of cash to sort of escalate that price and win the bid, you know, was de minimis compared to normal, normal times. And that's exactly right. That's why people did it. Not to mention, I think there was sort of an element of, well, house prices will keep going up, right? So, so even then it's like, maybe I'm overbidding now, but give it a little while and the price will catch up to what I paid for it, which in many markets over the last couple of years was probably true. Yep. Yep. And it was, yeah, it was, it was true until you know february of this year saying that right. it's like well if i'm buying in november of last year i'm like well like the you know it, it's moving up in four months is gonna gonna be close to what i paid anyway um and even That's if it's kind of why i kind of look at this well yes house prices are declining right now and actually where you are in san francisco they're declining the most we've lost roughly 10 percent now in the last four or five months in san francisco according to some of the popular indices but over the last three years, they've gained 40, 50 or 60 percent. So, you know, you, you know, you almost 150 percent more of what you paid three years ago. Take away 10. You're still up a you're lot, still up a lot. And most of the <laughs> right. countries in that case. So yeah. so so then that that really, um, you know, plays into the 2023 outlook. So um, so rates are end of December. They're hopefully drifting back down closer to six. Um, we had some positive inflation news this week. Um, mm -hmm. CPI is definitely ratcheting lower, um, uh, even though it's still high. Um, so, uh, so based on those things, what, what, do you, what comes next? What do you see? And, you know, we, we know in, in many markets that, that, um, you know, prices are down, but but uh, in a lot that they're not yet. So what do you see, like, as we're setting up now, what comes next for us? <coughs> well, so I, I like to dig a little bit deeper behind the headline number for inflation, because it's less about the overall, <coughs> excuse me, as much as it is, in particular, the, the, there are three primary categories. There's goods inflation, there's the service sector level of inflation and the service sector is by far the largest overall chunk and then within the service sector is where there's shelter inflation and this is sort of the the combination of rent growth as well as not house prices but sort of the implied increase in rent you'd have to pay to live in the house it's called owner's equivalent right um and that is the largest chunk of services if you break it down into three parts at the beginning of the pandemic, what started all of this in inflation was core goods. Uh, we had supply chain disruptions. We had all this fiscal stimulus. We decided we were all going to run out and you know, buy lots of uh, durable goods and home theaters and things like that for our houses. And the combination of the supply chain uh, uh, issues and the demand for goods spiked inflation. So inflation was primarily driven early by the goods sector. That's actually corrected and many, many goods are not actually deflating, like prices are not just slowing down, coming down. That's one thing that's happening sort of regardless of what the Fed may or may not do, right? They don't have much control over that. Um, but the service sector is still going gangbuster strong. In fact, that is the largest chunk in the recent release of, uh, of inflation that is causing continued inflation. It is slowing down, the pace of inflation is slowing down, but it's all coming from the service sector. And within it, mostly from shelter. Now, the good news is that shelter inflation is lagging the real world by up to a year. 
And so what's happening on the ground today, which is actually deflation, rents are coming down and house, you know, owner's equivalent rent is reflection of declining prices is coming down, isn't actually showing up in those headline numbers because it takes so long to work its way through. Going into 2023, you know, the Fed says, well, look, core goods already deflating. Shelter, just give it time. What's left? Services at shelter. That's your restaurant meals, your barbershop visits, and things like that. Um, there, it's also very labor intensive. The primary input into going out to a restaurant is labor. And there, the inflation is still pretty strong. Um, it is moderating, but it is that is sort of the core of what's left to be addressed in terms of inflationary pressure going into 2023. This is why the Fed is hyper-focused on wages and the labor market mismatches, because they need to see that cooling to know that you've got all three components, quote, taking care of, um, which I don't know. I, I would be surprised if uh, we, we don't get a 0.5 in by the Fed because we want to slow down the pace a little bit, given everything I just said but still cut rates because the job is not yet done. And going into next year, sorry, raise, raise the Fed funds rates, I apologize. Next year, raise the Fed funds rate again. Now the question for 2023 is, how many more times do you need to do it? And by 50 points or 25 basis point chunks, and that all depends on whether wage growth slows down for the service sector and whether service sector inflation decreases. So the joke, I have right now, since it's the holidays, is the best gift we can give to the Fed is not to go out to dinner. <laughs> <laughs> so, I don't know that the restaurants would be, be happy about that, but this is where the core of it lies. So to the housing market. Yep. And if the Fed has to keep raising Fed funds rate a little bit more. That's putting upward pressure on the 10-year treasury. And we all know what happens to mortgage rates with the 10-year treasury. If there's there's a, a risk of um, upward pressure, potentially back above seven again, and maybe even a little bit further as they sort of find that, quote, terminal level of the Fed funds rate over the next six months. That's interesting. So you see that there's a risk that mortgage rates uh, climb up in the spring, in the next few months over seven. Yeah, and I, that sort of goes against many of the other prognosticators. That's I great. might be wrong. By yeah, the well, way, we are you know, notoriously bad at forecasting mortgage. Well, and, and what you know, when I talk about the forecasting in general, and and like I'm interested in your take, but but more more I'm interested in how you got there. So the fact that that okay, like okay, so so the, we have all these these signals of inflation coming down, and uh, one of the things though that has been keeping mortgage rates high is the spread between the rates and the 10 year. Uh, that spread has been higher due to all kinds of market dynamics. Suddenly, uh, as rates had been falling for years and years, mortgage market buyers wanted to buy, buy mortgages. Uh, and then as rates spiked, they stopped wanting to buy them anymore. And so the spread went way up. So what's your take on the spread uh, maybe over the next few months? Does that come back down? Yeah. So uh, let me see. I'm going to a little bit of a technical economics term here. Are you ready for it? Yes. Uncertainty sucks. <laughs> <laughs> right? And yeah, if you're a buyer of mortgage-backed securities, then you're saying, well, I don't know what's going to happen with house prices and I don't know what's going to happen with rates going forward and why would I care from a risk perspective or require a bigger premium, if you will, in that spread? Well, for two things, you know, we just talked about the fact that many home buyers have made a bunch of money in house price appreciation that, you know, some loss is not the end of the world. But the person who bought in San Francisco in September, you know, who is now being bundled into a mortgage backed security, they're the ones who are more likely than not going to be underwater or more of their equity will be, be wiped away because they've had no benefit of the upside of growth in the first part. And so for the new mortgage-backed securities on new originations, this is a, a big deal. There's, there's the risk of negative equity, which elevates the possibility of foreclosure and foreclosure risk down the, down the line. So 
investors are smart. They know this. They're taking that into account. And then duration. You know, we talk about like how long will these mortgages stick around? Well, when rates stay up, or let's say it another way. The easy way to say it is if rates are always coming down, durations get short because you're always refinancing or you're always you know, buying the next house at a lower rate, which means your purchasing power, even if nothing else has changed, goes up. Um, and so declining rates sort of speed up the turnover and shorten the duration and uh, prepay speeds of loans and pools. But now with rates either flat or possibly higher, buyers stop buying, refinancing stops happens, happening. We already see it. I, I look at your Altos inventory data every week and I watch your video. What are you finding? Nobody's listing new anymore. Why? They've all got low mortgages. Yeah. That all increases duration and that creates more risk. It also increases the coupon speeds, but it, it creates a, an uncertainty scenario for investors. And that's why the spread is high. The good news is that we might actually be able to have mortgage rates come down, even if the Fed and the Treasury sort of stay at this sort of maybe slightly higher level next year, as I was describing, because the uncertainty could go away. If we really think inflation's licked, the Fed holds the line. The fact that they stop raising the Fed funds rate is an indication that they believe they've done their job and they just have to wait. That spread could come in and we could get a rate benefit of some declining mortgage rates by that fact. By that factor. Well, that would be nice. Um, and, you know, I've said that I, I, I look at it as a, it's about five and a half percent. When when rates were below that this summer, people were buying houses when they climbed up over six, six and a half. That's when it really stopped cold. Uh, yeah. So, so, uh, okay. So there is some uncertainty in rates, but hopefully they drift down. Um do you have a view on the broader economy? Like, are we heading for a recession? And what's that going to do? Yeah, this is, you know, rates are impossible to forecast and so are recessions. Recession. What's the joke? Re economists have predicted 11 of the last nine recessions, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> this is really bad. Um, and I, I feel like this time last year, everyone was so certain that a recession was going to happen in 2022. And now we're all so certain that it's going to happen in 2023. By the way, the consensus among economists is more than ever before certainty that a recession will happen in 2023. And by the way, that doesn't mean like the global financial crisis. That could be a much milder recession. But right. the consensus argument is, yes, we're going to have a recession. I'll say two points. I'm a terrible forecaster. I don't know that we will. Yeah. <laughs> um, the labor market is still super strong. Even if we get what we want, which is a weakening of the labor market, we're all hoping that it's by closing open jobs and not necessarily laying off lots of people. And you say, wait, Mark, but we've been reading all the headlines about everyone being laid off in the tech sector. The amount of people employed in the tech sector is still a very small share of the overall economy. And the amount of people employed in housing is still a rel they're bigger, but relatively small share. All the other sectors of the economy are kind of so far have laughed off the tightening of monetary policy. Right. I and mean, the unemployment rate is still below four. Yeah. So. So in that sense, there's a possibility of a soft landing here. OK, you're <laughs> you have you're like looking for some of the green shoots in, in there. That's in right. The, OK, that's great. OK, so let's add those together. And and say, OK, so, you know, home prices in general in in some areas are coming down already, uh, but they're coming down from nice and high. So actually, you know, year over year, uh, home prices in 2022 are up by our measure. It's up about 10 percent year over year over the end of 2021. Most of those gains happen in the first or second quarter anyway. Uh, so what's your view for home prices broadly? Uh, next year? Do they fall? As, what's your forecast? Does, does First American have an official forecast? Uh, we don't have an official forecast, um, but I would say you're absolutely right. I mean, the, the truth of the matter is house prices are falling already, right? Yeah. Um, so it depends on what metric you look at. If you look at over from their peak, you know, there are markets that are already declining. Um, when you look at the the analogy I've tried to use, and we'll try it here again to see if it works, is the roller coaster. You were absolutely right. We made a ton of gain 
in the first half of the year. That was sort of as we did in the whole year of 2021 during the pandemic. And so we went up one side of the roller coaster of house prices. And we've gone over the top. We're yeah. now coming down. But it, it depends on where you sort of do that comparison. Comparison to a year ago, we could still be higher. In fact, we are still higher. Even though we're on the downside of the roller coaster, it's still at a higher point than it was a year ago when we were just going up the roller coaster. Right. That means we're going to end up the year probably at zero or close to zero, maybe a few percentage points. And to your point, if you look at house prices in the way you do in your Altos data, it's going to be higher. If you look at constant quality indices like Case-Shiller and FHFA, it's going to be closer to zero. But essentially, to say we end the year at, say, nominally a couple of percent of growth, it just means that we didn't get all the way down the other side of the roller coaster to wipe away all that was gained, yeah. right? Yeah. Then the question is for 2023, does does the does the downside of the roller coaster keep going? And I think to some extent a little bit, yes. That I don't see any reason why house prices would stop correcting miraculously in January. Um so what is going to happen though, we'll use the old uh, stats term here. You're going to get very unfavorable comparisons later next year by right by which i mean now i'm a year yeah. ahead and i'm comparing to a downside of yeah the so april ride. may in 2023 are going to be really unfavorable comparisons yes so that um, year over year number could in fact actually get bigger even though house prices have actually stopped going down say middle to late next year we'll can, for the same reason that we didn't see it going this way, well, yeah. it'll it'll look worse in a year over year. The, the headlines will look worse. On the other hand, yeah. the year over year compar comparisons on inflation get more favorable by exactly. mid next year. So exactly. you know, may, yeah. maybe that we'll we'll have that mixed up. Okay, so um, so uh, just to see if I can we can put a pin in it. Uh, do you think you think home prices broadly decline? Uh, let me, let me put a little context. My, you know, our right. friends... my advisor said to me in school, when you forecast, either forecast the amount or when, but never both. Uh -huh. And in either case, don't look surprised if you get it right. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. Okay. You know, I'm going to give you the when, because uh, okay. I think that's actually the right. All right. That's see. an interesting call. Let's, let's talk about when. I think if we hit the, the path of inflation that, that is currently expected um, and the Fed stops raising rates late spring, early summer, and we sort of hit that terminal rate, the uncertainty becomes more certain. Uh, inflation will be clearly showing trending downwards. All these good things will be happening from the, from the rate perspective. And that means that spread will come in and mortgage rates will begin to um, scale back a little bit again. And so the second half of the year, I think is stabilization under that scenario, in which case house prices will also stabilize in the latter half. We okay. So your when that. call is that it's going to be most dramatic in the first half of the year. Yep. Okay. And slow down dramatically stabilization in the second half of 2023. All right. Uh, that's, that's great. I love that insight. That's a, um, a, uh, that's a great way to look at it. Um, okay. So uh, let's switch gears a little bit. So, so, uh, do you have um, do you have some metrics or some uh, uh, things that we should be paying attention to that don't get enough play in the headlines? Are there things? Is there is there stuff that that you like uh, that that we should you know teach our listeners to pay more attention to? Yeah, I, I think uh, we've touched on um, on the on the economic side of things. You know, it varies from time to time. But right now, if you're in housing and you want to focus on uh, an economic barometer, it is inflation and it's not the headline. It's how I describe that breakdown. And, you know, they're all, everyone's sort of showing those breakdowns now. So that gives you the good insight. Seeing shelter inflation come back down, seeing service sector inflation slow, if not actually decline. That is key to everything we've been talking about. Right. Yep. On the housing side, um, with house prices, again, be wary the headline. Right. Um, you know, that doesn't really tell us about what's going on. Well, delve into the from peak numbers, not the year over years, because they're going to be misleading. And then your stuff. 
the listings. Yeah. There's something fascinating happening in listings today. Um, and that is, do you know the old adage that what is too hot, too cold, just right, or just tight? I like to say I get it, just tight in terms of monetary policy, um, in terms of the amount of month supply relative to house price appreciation and depreciation. What's the old adage? Oh, month, the month supply adage? It's yeah. like, what do they talk about, like three or four months or something like that? Of supply? Well, it used to be six. The old okay. adage was six months of supply was neither too cold nor too hot, just right. And yep. yes, think Goldilocks, right? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> right? yeah. Um, and then under that scenario, you would usually neither have depreciation. Depreciation occurs when month supply goes um, above six. So there's more inventory relative demand. And appreciation of house prices when month supply goes below six. Now, We've clearly seen in the last two years some of the tightest inventory markets in modern data track housing market history. Right. Less than a month. And consequently, gangbuster house prices. Right. Um, but now your data and others are showing that month supply, while up from their historic lows, are now in the high two, low three month supply range, which by the old adage is well below six. Yep. And therefore, there shouldn't be house price depreciation. But there is at three. At three. And you can go back for like 30 years and show the scatter plot that where this sort of analogy or this conventional wisdom comes from. And it's a beautiful, it lines right up. Yeah. Above Why six, do you think that is? Of, well, I think in the old days, it took a long time. Like the pace of the market was generally slower. You know, if you think about the housing market, housing is a um, a perfectly heterogeneous, every house is different, um, um, non-movable good, right? It, it matters where it is. That's not like most goods. And so it mattered um, the amount of supply trying to match the buyer to the seller. That was a complex process. And if you go back you and I might be old enough to remember the pre-internet days, that's why you hired a real estate agent because they were the only ones who knew what was potentially for sale or out on the market. And they took you around to try and match you. So it was a very labor intensive process to match buyer to seller for a, for a heterogeneous good like housing. And that was also why that conventional wisdom sort of came about of, you know, typically 90 days for to sell a house. Remember that? Yeah. Uh, yeah what are we at now? 17? <laughs> yeah. Well, it's certainly climbing now. Uh, they, the, yeah. the time to sell is certainly climbing now. And, uh, you know, it's like um, the it'll be really interesting. We're still lower than normal time to sell because like anything that's uh, that was on the market longer sold. So we don't have anything that's been sitting around for, you know, very long. 24 right. months unsold. Like that stuff's all gone. And so, you know, the like. You know that that days on market has to build from here, and it'll be really fascinating to see where that changes in the spring. You know, we get fresh inventory in the spring, and if people are like, people will buy some, but how much? And and like that'll, that's a that's going to be a good one to keep our eye on okay. there. Um, but what I think has changed, right? What I think has changed fundamentally is we for the for any given amount of demand, we we need less active inventory today because the matching process is so much more efficient due to technology, right? The, the Zillow, Redfin, all these platforms of the world where it's really easy, the cost of information is really low to be able to go and find houses that you think match your preferences. And so that sort of technological change, I think is basically making, you don't need as much for any lo given level of demand. And so maybe three becomes the new six. Interesting. In terms okay. of the conventional wisdom, this is going to be something really interesting to watch. To watch. So, so say that again. So, for any given level of demand, we need less supply than we used to, because before you had to wade through, like you had to wade through. Now you can, now you can bullseye right to the the one you want. Exactly. Interesting. Exactly. Uh, okay, I like that. Information is lower, and technology makes the matching process much more efficient. Much more efficient. So this is a, a theme that Clayton Collins, uh, the CEO of Housing Wire, uh, has been talking about lately. And, and, you know, he and I have been discussing and the question is like, you know, is the uh, like the how does technology and 
the impact the velocity of the market and and what is it uh what are those then downstream implications so that's a really great um uh, quantification of it that that I hadn't thought about before and you know we've had declining available inventory for a decade as rates were low and so uh and then during the pandemic they the inventory dropped dramatically um as rates dropped dramatically and uh so so what we're saying is that climbing back inventory, you know, if inventory is 500 and whatever it is, 35,000 homes right now, single family homes on the market this moment, um, you know, where 2019, it was 850,000. Uh, so we're still, you know, 35, 36% below that time, that, uh, you know, just pre-pandemic. So what you're saying is that we might get, if we get back up to say 700,000, that might be enough to, to balance the market out in a way that previously was 800, 900 or a million. Exactly. I mean, it, it depends, right? The, the amount of inventory is all, as I said, relative to any given level of demand, but assuming, well, our, our bigger problem right now is a lack of demand, right? <laughs> um, due to everything we talked about with rates and affordability and buying power, but you're absolutely right. You won't need as much for the same amount of demand going forward as you did in the past. Great insight. That's a really, that's really cool. Um, cool. Okay. So um, is there anything that, uh, that you published at, at housing at, at, at first American uh, recently that, that you want us to, to want to call our attention to like, what's, what's the latest thinking that you like? Sure. So a, a lot of what we've been talking about here today, um, we've written blog posts on our econ center that um, you can find at our company website easily enough, firstdown.com. Um, we publish there uh, at least once a week. Um, we do an analysis called our real house price index, which basically takes into account the cost of buying a home as a function of that buying power. And um, that is, it's, it's an affordability measure directly, right? Because it's not about the nominal amount. It's about the uh, price per month. Um, simple analogy, if house prices go up by 10%, but my buying power also goes up by 10% because rates went down in real terms. You know, we're all familiar with real terms with inflation these days. In real terms, you're awash. What's happened in the last year, though, is house prices have gone up and buying power has gone down, which means in real terms, housing has gotten a lot more expensive. So, that's something that's that great. We really focus on there. Yeah. So then, let's you know, let me ask you about that real quick. Um, yeah. That on that 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 real house price index. So, um, you know, m m my observation has been uh, was was this five and a half percent threshold. Uh, so September, the first couple of days of September, mortgage rates went from like five five point four, and they jumped over five and a half to six to six and a half to seven. And we could watch in that moment, some of the indicators like the price reductions well, launched up. Inventory late September in October started climbing, you know, when rates went mm -hmm. from five and a half to six to seven and a half, like in that range. Uh, and then after October, rates started ticking down. So my, so, so my observation is five and a half is a threshold I'm looking for to see activity. Do you have a have a, a way to use that real house price index, uh, that that um, that uh, buying power view, to to test my hypothesis to to or to like see does it like does yeah we it could dive? do something I yeah we could take a look I mean uh, it basically takes three things into account the change in mortgage rates and I, I believe you're right qualitatively I think that magic sort of. Um, psychological threshold is somewhere in that six mark. Um, but uh, is that it takes into account the change in mortgage rates. It actually takes into account income as well, because your buying power is a function of income. And that's not doing enough, but it is doing a little to offset the loss due to rising rates. But then it's the house price thing that was really, you know, for most of the last decade, buying power was going up faster than prices. But over the last couple of years, just couldn't keep up. Yeah. Um, because that, uh, and, and what you're seeing happening is that magic sort of uh, inflection that you observed in your data. Um, I will point out, and I know you pointed out too, 
that increase in inventory is not because lots of new inventory is showing up. We should talk right. about that, right? right? But that which is for sale is hanging out longer. And that is definitely an indication of the buyer demand changing and being reflected by that change in purchasing power. A half point change in the mortgage rate can be the difference between 50 or 60 or $100,000 for some people, right? Yep. Yeah. Um, that's there. But it all gets sorted out by prices. Here's The Economist, right? If a market's out of whack, what's the thing that brings it back into, into what we call equilibrium? Prices. Prices are adjusting. That can be painful, but prices are adjusting to the new reality of less buying power today. Yeah. So uh, you had a comment in there. You said most of the last decade, uh, buying power in, improved, uh, affordability improved most of the last decade. Affordability was, yes, because your buying power was going up faster than house prices. So if house prices Rates were coming five, down, then essentially the real price to you is less, which is what drove, the, particularly in the pandemic, you, we cut rates dramatically, another percent or two. We were right around five pre-pandemic yeah. or four and change. Four and change. And then we cut down to three and below three. Well, that, that sort of juice to house buying power made everybody go out. And as we talked about at the top of this, the podcast, you know, bid up. Well, what does the bid up show ultimately as? It shows us increased house prices in our indices. And, and um, that was why house prices were going so fast, uh, because we were producing so much buying power. But that's turned now with falling buying power and continued house price appreciation. Yeah, right? yeah, for uh, sure. Everything is going against you but income right now. But income. And so, um, so the real home price index, like that, that guy has been easing down over the the years, decade. Yep. the decade. And then last two years, there, there was an inflection point last couple of years. Or la there's an inflection point this year when this it started year. spiking. It just, like and it, and it was, must be steep, right? A steep climb. Yep. And so how far back have we gotten? Like is uh, it We go back to 2000. So, but so, so like our, is our affordability now at 2016 level? Did we, how much of that? That improvement did we erase? Are you ready for this? Early 2000s level. So we're not, yeah, we're, we're not even anywhere there yet, right? Yeah, um, because we've grow house buying power is up something like 350% compared to 2000. Yeah, um, even with so rates at six and a half. Uh, I guess it's a little bit lower now because rates are six and a half, but it's still multiples of where we were before. And, you know, People sort of, they get the correlation backwards, right? House prices are high. No, uh, house prices are high and that's causing something. No, house prices are a reflection of the fact that we've yeah. had since the pandemic, since the uh, global financial crisis, a big reduction in the rate environment to rock bottom rate, you know, mortgage rates below 3% for a 30 year fix. Like that's unheard of, probably will be never heard of again. Yeah. Um, and that's why house prices went up so much. We were juicing buying power ridiculously. Yeah, I, I look at it and, you know, people people were saying, oh, people are nuts doing the overbidding. And, the, and, and it's like, no, they were they were acting really rational. They were taking right. advantage of the best deal ever. And and they were, you know, there they were some timing, you know, if you bought in Boise and, in, in, you know, January of this year and overbid, you still locked in low, but you, you might, have, you know, that yeah. might be the window. That's true. But like, and I'm, I'm sure if one were to think of it as purely a financial decision, I'm buying an asset, I'm going to time the buy, I'm going to time the sell. By the way, what do all of your financial advisors tell you to do with regard Never to timing time. in the stock market? Don't yeah. do it. Don't do it. <laughs> There's an added wrinkle to housing. I like living in that house in Boise, or I like going there when it's winter time to ski. Yeah. So unlike your traditional asset that you buy for the pure financial hopeful gain, you get this wonderful utility of shelter component out of housing. That means timing. Yeah, you may have timed it right. Great. But will that reflect your decision? Are you going to run out and sell it and sort of capitalize all those gains? Probably not. In fact, yeah. your data shows not. Yeah, very rarely. Right. Very right. rarely. That's uh, that's really interesting. And th there's, um, you know, there is uh, 
a lot of talk. It was on the uh, odd the Bloomberg Odd Lots podcast a, a while ago, and we talked about the bullwhip effect, where there's the pandemic has you know lumber prices shot up and then dropped back down, and and shipping containers went shot up and went back down. It's like this bullwhip effect, and um, and gasoline like gasoline is back down really low in a lot of the country mm -hmm. and and um uh there was some there was some uh indication of like too much natural gas in in europe like the, like this bullwhip yeah. effect is like everywhere and yeah. one of the things that we see is like so this pandemic was you know we have this crazy bubble in the pandemic uh, and then things are correcting back down sort of okay we're back down to 2020 levels and then we resume on our way on our merry way uh, like with some of those markets and i wonder do you do you have a gut for whether is how is that is that what housing is going to do are we going to like reverse that affordability stuff back down to you know 2020 we 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 pretend that the pandemic never happened and then we go on our merry way and people transact on houses is that is that a scenario so will there be a bullwhip effect in housing yeah no <laughs> okay <laughs> But okay. here, so here's why. And yeah. Uh, yeah, like not, I don't believe in the real fancy forecasts because they generally don't get it right. But the basic premise is, look, if we take a long run average growth rate in house price appreciation, that's somewhere between three and five percent. Um, and you compound that for, say, three years, pandemic years, 21, 22 and let's go into 23, or you could start halfway through 2020 and go halfway through 23. Take three years of it. Three years at a normal rate of price appreciation is going to get you cumulatively somewhere around maybe 20% total. Uh, I'm doing totally back of the envelope math, right? Yep. So if we say that, then, and house prices actually went up over that same three-year period of, say, 30, 35, 40, then there will be a correction down to where we would have ended up had we not had the bull whip in the first place. Right, right. right. Um, so I, I think, I think there is an element of, I guess, a bull whip in the sense that we there was over appreciation in the asset during the pandemic. That's true. Driven by an increased demand in the desire to own homes. Yep. Um, and the cheapest money ever to buy them. <laughs> Right. Yeah. Those two things. Yeah. Um, but so we're going to we're going to work out or unwind some of that excess like in other bullwhip markets. But I don't think there's this big sort of rebound whip with big house price declines. I mean, there's still not enough inventory to buy. And even if you forget the pandemic altogether, as a general statement over the last 10 years, we've not been building enough housing to shelter all the households that want it. And remember what we said at the beginning? You can't move it. You can't offshore it. I need to provide it here. There's not enough. That puts a lot of sort of underpinning on house prices because a scarce good, which housing is today, um, you know, keeps prices from collapsing. Yeah, that's interesting. So uh, let's let's pull on that for a second. The the not enough housing. Um, there is uh, not in my backyard. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> exactly. So, so tell me about how you, your view of what you mean by not enough housing. Well, so it's not, it's not what we focus generally on in the housing market, which is the flow of things available for sale. When I talk about not enough housing, I'm talking about the stock, right? How many housing units do we have in the United States versus how many households, because all households generally want to live in housing, want shelter, right? Yep. I'll make that general assumption. I think most people would agree with me. Um, and so we've had very steady household formation. In fact, accelerated household formation over the last decade as millennials aged into forming households. It's now fading, but a big boom from demographics of lots of households being formed looking for shelter. Shelter can come in the form of rental housing or owned. Mm -hmm. Relative to after the pandemic, home builders you know, they shut down in the pandemic and they've spent the last decade really struggling to sort of um, ramp up on their ability to add more housing to the stock. Not only do you need to literally grow the stock, but you also have to replace a little bit of it every year that sort of gets demolished or becomes dilapidated. And so when you sort of measure 
how much do I have to grow the housing stock by versus the demand for housing? We've been underbuilding for a decade. Yeah. To the tune of millions of units. Depending and on this, who you listen to, it's a couple. Yeah, of yeah. And, and so I so okay. So that's uh I buy that that logic. And and um uh in this moment though, we have like record numbers of new homes under construction, don't we? Yes, they're all stuck and they're not being, well, they're about to be delivered in the early yeah. part of next year. Yep. So how does that play in? But How does that play into the, we don't have enough, you know, we have record under construction, we don't have enough. And how does that play into, you know, uh, the supply and demand equation for the next year? How do you look at that? And and even into your, the, the real house price index, like the affordability scenario. Well, so the challenge here is you would think, yeah, I mean, all houses are created equal, right? And so if I just deliver more houses, we'll just solve the problem. Yeah. Right? No. One, it matters where. <laughs> and two, the prices come in all different sizes and shapes and prices. And the new home market is not typically built for the first time home buyer. It's built for the existing homeowner who would move up, but those existing homeowners all have 3% mortgages. Yeah. So it's a more complex challenge than like, well, all this inventory shows up, even the scale of it. Typically new homes are about 10% of the total market. So you would have to really bring a lot of new homes to market to influence the overall supply of stock, which is somewhere in the well above a hundred million housing units in the United States today, right? So the sheer scale of the new home market is not enough. And then the bigger problem is that it doesn't necessarily match the demand in terms of pricing and or location. Um, will it help? Of course. Will it solve the problem? No. Got it. And and I think it's interesting that, you know, if, if we have normally you have a, a million homes on the market. And normally in the last decade, call it a million homes on the market. And then you have, um, you know, uh, a million new homes get built. So you have like a hundred thousand at any given time, maybe coming. So, so maybe it's 10% of the, of the market is new home. So exactly. something like that's that. a rough, a very good rough added rough estimate. 10%. And that, that's what now I though, thinking. we have 500,000 and we have, maybe 150,000 or more of those, 200,000 of those getting uh, completed. So all of a sudden the new home construction is 40% of the market. That's a great point. The share definitely goes up. You're right. And so it becomes a more dominant, I hadn't thought of that. That's a really good point. It becomes a more dominant part, but then you still have the problem. Is it priced right for those who are demanding? Mm -hmm. What we expect to happen is because this glut will all show up, um, that, that will put even more downward pressure on new home prices. Right? In a way, you kind of need to make that thing attractive enough to cause that existing homeowner to want to give up his 3% mortgage and move. Yeah. When rates are six. <laughs> right. So somehow that difference in purchasing power actually theoretically would end up being a price be, be fixed by a price reduction on the part of the builder on the builder so it's almost like the new home uh market is going to be more price um volatile sensitive. price volatile. sensitive price volatile this year than the existing market yep that'd Absolutely. be an interesting that'd be an interesting um outcome wouldn't it for the year Really fascinating. Um, are there things um, uh, that you have in the first American world? Are there data points that we don't get to see elsewhere? Are there like, um, you know, mortgage things or, or th insights that we should, that, that you have that you're like, you know, you can give us the. <laughs> <laughs> Do I have any special sauce? No. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I'm lucky because as we mentioned at the top of the podcast, I, I have access to all of that rich data um, that we collect in our in our data and analytics division. And so there we have the public records data that everyone is very familiar with. We have, um, we collect public records data in a variety of different ways that gives us insights. So we, we collect what are called title plants. And without getting into the details of title plants, it's a more rich feature set of 
what's in the public record. So you get a lot more details on off the deeds and the deeds of trust and things like that. Um, so we have access to all of that. Uh, we buy data uh, like the listing stuff and other sources. So we, we buy some data assets. Um, and we have access obviously to our own business data. Uh, and right now, actually, it's really interesting to study um, sort of what are the leading indicators, right? We're talking about forecasting in this in this episode. Like, well, what is what are leading in mortgage applications are leading indicators of things to come. Um, our own business data is leading indicators of things to come. So we do get a sense because the title process starts relatively early on. Opening that order with us starts around the same time as the application. So we do have access to sort of that leading indicator view of the market. And it's telling us what you would expect, right? More softening, you know, this is apps are saying the same thing, more softening to come until rates are stabilized, wherever they may stabilize. Got it. Well, that's great. That's a great insight uh, to, to know, um, you know, that like those, those leading indicators are, are, they're all kind of pointing in the same direction right now. And, and rates, and and like seeing if rates settle in and and hopefully that spread compresses a little bit uh so you know we have so even if the the tenure doesn't come down our mortgage rate can come down a little bit and get us maybe into the fives i think we could probably have a a, a few transactions at least in the spring I, and look i mean it could look pretty dire depending upon what seat you sit in but if you take the longer view a mortgage rate of five and a half or six percent, with house prices finally growing at a more nominal rate, maybe a little bit above inflation, like they always historically used to, with a sufficient amount of supply, maybe to wrap this all up around a Goldilocks three months of supply for the given velocity of the market today. Yeah. You mean a healthy and normal market, Mike? Yeah. We haven't had one of those in like 20 years. 20 years. Like when was the last time? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, I love it. Um, so so then let's do this. Let's kind of wrap it up with this one. The, the thing I like to ask a lot of my guests is longer term future. What do you think about the housing market in five, 10 years? Yeah. And, and what do you think? Like, where do you think it's going and what should we pay attention to? Um. I'm always bullish because you can't outsource it, and outsource it and everybody needs it fundamentally as a good. That's great for us. I think the big thing that is there, there are two long term drivers over the next five years, 10 years, even the trends in demographics, because we've got a few more years of millennials aging in. But after that, Generation Z is much smaller. Right. And we will also begin to see, um, how do I put it nicely, um, baby boomers aging out of home ownership. Yeah. And, and so our, our, the, Democra the demographic underpinnings, are, have, which have been favorable for, to us for the last decade, are going to sort of change to being a little less favorable. Although our other problem is lack of inventory. So how can we build, can we build our way out of it? possibly that'll take some time but remember the demographic aging out will also supply housing back into the market that hasn't been there historically in the last few years right yeah the, the over 65 home ownership rate is something like 75 percent right so there is a lot of housing essentially sort of locked up in or in ba with baby boomers right now and they will eventually put those houses back onto the market um, so those are the two things, supply of stock in the long run and the demographic trends and how those two things work together with each other. Right. Uh, but generally you're, you're broadly bullish because, you know, we got to live in these houses in the U S well, as long as we don't have another one of these things before I retire, I will be happy. It's just, it's <laughs> one more bubble. I won't screw this one up. Just one more bubble. One more bubble. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, Mark, terrific conversation. Really appreciate your time. Um, I I should uh, mention that uh, that I love your podcast, the Reconomy podcast that you and Odetta do. How often does that come out? Uh, every two weeks. Two weeks. Two weeks. And it's YouTube. It's mostly just YouTube talking about here's the latest stuff that we should know about. Yeah. 
Yeah, we try and not, not unlike what we just did here, we'll take one specific topic, try and boil it down in a conversation just so everyone can understand it. Nine to 12 minutes. Yeah, they're, uh, they're fast. The way to work, if you go to work on your way to Starbucks, if you're getting a latte. Nice they're, they're really things. great. I, I, I yeah. and, and you and Odetta on those are, are they're terrific. I really appreciate those. So that's the Reconomy podcast. Uh, yeah, definitely look for that. Right. And you and you guys publish on the First American uh, blog. What's what's that? Uh, it's uh, firstam.com slash economics. Slash economics. So that you can you can check out Mark's work there. All right. And um, other places, link follow you on LinkedIn or Twitter or those kind of places? Yep. Um, I'm on LinkedIn as me. Um, and uh, Twitter is M Fleming, the letters DC. I live in Washington, DC, um, M Fleming, DC. Um, and yeah, we, we often post, we, we have a little more fun on Twitter in particular. Yeah. Um, and um, often also post up there much of the content that we're producing and putting on those other platforms. Terrific. Great. Mark, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. My pleasure. Always good, Mike. All right. Thanks, everybody. This is the Top of Mind podcast. Thanks for joining me. As always, go to altosresearch.com to get your data to help you communicate like all of this stuff to your clients, to your buyers and sellers right now, because they need to know what's going on and they need to hear from you. So that's what we do. Uh, thanks, everybody. More next week. Thanks for listening to Top of Mind. See you again next time and be sure to click subscribe to get future episodes.